She was voted by the Seattle Times as one of the 150 most powerful people in Seattle's history. Part popular restaurateur, part influential politician. Ruby Chow is best known for promoting good relations with the Chinese-American community in the greater Seattle area. As Mona Locke reports, it is a legacy that lingers today. In the late 40s, as Americans celebrate a bustling economy but fear the realities of a Cold War, every major city has a gathering place, a restaurant or tavern where people congregate to eat and drink and discuss the issues of the day. In Seattle, that place is Ruby Chow's. So we saw this place up there on Broadway and Jefferson, and I don't know what made me say it. I saw a sign out there saying there was a restaurant, an Italian restaurant. I said, you know, that would be the place to run the restaurant. It is the place, and will be for the next three decades. Ruby rubs elbows with stars who frequent her establishment, stars like Sammy Davis Jr., Big band conductor Tommy Dorsey and actor Danny Kay. Why do you think all these people loved your restaurant so much? They want a service. When they go out to eat, they want service and they want good food. But Ruby Chow's is also the place where prominent people come to make deals. And I'm sure there were a lot of deals cut in the back room uh, that probably helped to shape uh, the city and the county as we know it today. Author and historian Walt Crowley says it wasn't uncommon for politicians and businessmen to meet at Ruby's. It was also really the Democratic Party clubhouse for King County. Uh, she was a very generous uh, hostess and donor for the Democratic Party and other progressive causes. Uh, so this was a very, very active establishment. The establishment gradually catapults Ruby Chow into the limelight as one of the best-known Chinese Americans in Seattle. By her side the entire time is her husband Ping, who did most of the cooking in the restaurant's kitchen and doubled as a star in the Chinese opera circuit. Through the years, Ruby's growing notoriety gives her access to a long list of dignitaries and celebrities, including President and Madame Chiang Kai-shek of the Republic of China, Bob Hope, and Presidents Gerald Ford and Jimmy Carter. But hobnobbing with celebrities isn't enough for Ruby Chow. I just knew that there were things that had to be done, so I just go do it. Over time, Ruby feels the nudge to get involved in public service. In 1949, I, Northwest Airlines called me and asked me to take care of a little girl, the first refugee from, from Shanghai. The parents had sent the little girl over because of the refugee situation. Ruby begins taking care of a lot of people. The most famous, actor Bruce Lee, who happens to be the son of a family friend. Bruce came up here, uh, came up to Seattle to see the fair, and he liked it very much. He, then he told me he wasn't shy about it. He told me that he wanted to prove to his father that he could go to university without him. And would I let him stay with us? And he's a very smart young man, very talented one, and a very handsome young man, and very resourceful. Ruby and Ping help Bruce Lee, and they help just about anyone who needs assistance in the Chinese-American community. They come and ask me to do something, I do it. If I'm able to do it, I do it. But Ruby does more than help individuals. She becomes a trailblazer of sorts for integrating Chinese culture into mainstream life in the Northwest. She establishes the Chinese drill team and sponsors floats for the Seafair Parade. In 1964, she helps a Chinese organization called the Chenghua Benevolent Association to host its first annual Governor's Chinese New Year's Dinner. Since 1964, every Washington state governor has attended the event. They should be involved in our culture. Our culture, the Chinese culture is 5,000 years. So it was important for the governors to... To understand us and to know us. And the only way he could do is to, to interact with our people. Sometimes Ruby's own interaction with the community involves correcting the wrongs of racial biasing. She remembers the time when two Chinese girls are turned away for job interviews at the local phone company. Ruby confronts the company manager on his next visit to her restaurant. I said, how come you folks aren't hiring? You've got the sign out there, you're not hiring. So we're hiring people. 
I said, well, I don't know. I have some girls that didn't want, that wanted to go down to work, and when they got to the counter, they were told that there were not uh, any jobs open. He said, they did? I said, yes, they did. He said, he told them to come down and see me. Oh, I said, yes, that's fine. I'll send them down. So I sent them down to see Mr. Fitzgerald. And Mr. Fitzgerald came in the next week, Ruby, where can you find some more of those girls? They are wonderful workers. I said, well, that's fine. I'm glad you found out. Perhaps the most important and pivotal moment in Ruby Chow's life comes in 1973, when 75 Chinese men are arrested during a Chinese New Year's party. They are arrested for allegedly running an illegal gambling operation. They took 75 of them into the paddy wagon and put them in jail for listening to opera music. And I was up all night getting them out. Ruby has a visit with Mayor Wes Ullman, who is so outraged at the way the Chinese men were treated that he makes a call to the Seattle police chief. The 75 Chinese men are released and charges are dropped. After that, I just thought, well, I'd like to see what it's like to be in politics. After 31 years of running a successful restaurant, Ruby needs a change. She runs for public office and in 1973 is the first Asian American woman to be elected to the King County Council. When you won the election, what was your reaction? Well, I was surprised, but then I was happy. Uh, three men ran against me. Quickly, Ruby Chow becomes a force to reckon with. One newspaper calls her as tough as any Chicago ward boss. She is instrumental in increasing affirmative action. She pushes through a boat tax ordinance. She establishes a bilingual teaching program, and she becomes an advocate for the needy and downtrodden. Uh, facilities, especially for low income, uh, housing, um, community services, economic development, employment programs, and so on. She was, she was at the forefront of all of those fights uh, and had a very positive uh, and, and important uh, impact. She made a difference. But Ruby doesn't always have the best relations with others in the Asian American community. She insists on calling the international district Chinatown, a sore subject among some Asian Americans. There were clashes with the Filipinos, Japanese Americans. Uh, there, you know, there are tensions within the Chinese community. The criticism never seems to phase Ruby Chow one bit. They either love me or they, don't, or they hate me. So. I'm not going to stand around and worry about that. I only worry about the people that I think is important to me. After 12 years in public office, Ruby Chow steps down in 1985, but she continues to do what she can to weave Chinese American traditions into the fabric of Seattle culture. A lot of people call you a role model. I mean, do you see yourself as a role model? Well, I'm grateful that they think of me as a, a role model, but most of the things has to be done that it just has to be done. Her accomplishments do not go unnoticed. She is voted as one of the most influential women in Washington's history. A park in Georgetown is dedicated in Ruby's honor for her community service. And this year, the Organization of Chinese Americans presented her with their Golden Circle Lifetime Achievement Award. Oh, Harry. Are you doing okay? I mean, Thank you just... Now, at the age of 86, Ruby and her 92-year-old husband, Ping, still visit friends in the area they help preserve. Do you have a sense of pride for this area? Oh, yes, because um, I grew up in this area, and I watch it grow. Do you feel like you've made a difference for this community? <laughs> well, I think I did, but uh, I really don't know it. But ask anybody on the street here, and they'll tell you about the influence of Ruby Chow. It's Asunta. Hi. Hello. What's going on? Asunta Ng, publisher of the Northwest Asian Weekly, still cherishes the contribution Ruby has made to the Chinese American community. She has done a lot, and uh, when people mention her name, you know, it immediately uh, remind them of toughness. Uh, but, you know, I know her, so she has some kind of sweetness that nobody is aware. You know, she can be very sweet, very charming. So uh, I've been charmed by her all these years. Yeah, but she's tough, 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 tough. You're tough and sweet. Tough and sweet. Well, my husband doesn't say that to me. 
<laughs> it's safe to say that Ruby Chow is a humble person who doesn't like to talk about her accomplishments. But there is no question that her public service helped pave the way for other Asian Americans who followed. If you have uh, uh, planted the seed of public service and, and lit the spark for a commitment to public life, then you have left a real legacy in your community, and she's certainly done that. Ruby Chow calls herself a happy mother, a happy woman, and someone blessed with a wonderful husband. But in 2004, Ruby suffered a stroke. Although it was a setback, at 86, she's still active and still speaking her mind. When a person gets a massive stroke, what do they get? They don't stay. I, I'm still alive, and I'm still able to still do some work. Not physically work, but my mind is still going. I think you're going to be around for a long time. Well, that's what they keep telling me. Ruby Chow hopes to complete an autobiography of her life. That is, if she can find enough time to finish it. Next.